By the way, um, remember that molecules don't like forming um, radicals. How did we know that the bromine was going to steal this hydrogen and not, say, this hydrogen or this hydrogen? How do we know that it's going to prefer to form the allylic radical? Why is this a superior radical than putting the radical over here? Yeah, that's good. A lot of students don't realize that's the theme of this whole second semester. The whole second semester is about resonance. Almost every single topic, resonance is going to be one of the key issues. Unfortunately, many students never think about resonance unless the problem has the word resonance in it. But we should be thinking about resonance on most of the problems this semester. Last semester, resonance wasn't so important, but that's the whole theme for this term. Uh, yeah, there's another resonance structure where this unpaired electron could be put down here. Well, we know that the more we can spread out an unhappy um, feature, the better off we're going to be. If we put the unpaired electron over here, there wouldn't be any resonance because it's too far away. This is, again, the reason why we wanted to do the radical halogenation while, we still, while this carbon was still allylic. If we waited until this wasn't allylic, then we couldn't be sure that, the, uh, that we would halogenate here. If we wait until the double bond is gone, we could halogenate here or here or here. At, well, not here because there's no hydrogen, but we could, we could halogenate anyway with any place with a hydrogen. I've been writing this right. Now. That looks nice. Okay, but in any case, um, the key point is we want to do this while this is still a lick, so we, we'll be selected for that. All right, now we have this bromine on here. Okay, um, for this problem, we didn't need to know this mechanism, but you do need to know this mechanism for the, the next midterm that's coming up. Um, so here's the steps. Uh, but I think I'll erase this now. All right, so. So what we've got So we put a bromine here. Now, we don't want to end up with a bromine. We want this to be a deuterium. Now, um, again, this should strike us as a kind of unusual reaction, because deuterium is basically a type of hydrogen, right? Um, and we don't usually stick hydrogens onto things. We only know a couple reactions that stick hydrogens onto things. Another way of putting this is now we need to defunctionalize this atom, because right now this has a functional group, the bromine. But over here, it has no functional groups. Deuterium is not a functional group, and phenyl is not a functional group. So we have to ask, what ways do we know for defunctionalizing atoms? And we really only know one or two ways um, to do that. Um, I think, sorry? Yeah. So um, I think probably what your instructor was going for here, someone earlier mentioned using magnesium in the Grignard reagent. Well, here's where we can do that. Now we can use magnesium and the Grignard reagent. Uh, the other way to do this is with lithium aluminum hydride. Um, we could use lithium aluminum hydride or magnesium in a grignard. Uh, well, let's try the magnesium approach. So how do you make a grignard? You just add magnesium to an alkyl halide. You make a grignard by adding magnesium to an alkyl halide. You learned about grignards last term, uh, but oftentimes students forget about that. That's still going to be really important this term. It's very important to review the key ideas for grignard reagents. How do we make a grignard reagent? An alkyl halide plus magnesium. This is called an insertion reaction, because the magnesium just inserts between the bromine and the carbon. By the way, your instructor likes to write Grignard reagents as ionic bonds. And the way to do that is erase the covalent bond and then stick in charges. So this is how your instructor would usually write a Grignard reagent. Rather than writing as covalently bonded, it would write it like this. Erase the covalent bond and then put in the charges. Why is the carbon stealing the electrons from the magnesium? Because carbon is to the left of magnesium in the periodic table. That's the whole purpose of putting in magnesium to get the negative charge on this carbon. All right, uh, now this carbon can be a nucleophile. And what we want it to do now is attack a hydrogen. Uh, so uh, let's see, what type of hydrogen do people usually use here? Well, you just use water. So 
This would be our step one. This is our step two. You might remember from last term that you need to keep Grignard reagents away from protic solvents because they destroy the protic solvents. Well, in this case, we actually want to destroy the protic solvent. We want it, uh, I'm sorry, we, the, uh, the protic solvent destroys the Grignard reagent. Well, we want this to attack. We don't want to put a hydrogen on, we want to put a deuterium. So yeah, that's good that you checked that. So D2O is just water with deuteriums instead of hydrogens. But yeah, that's a good point. After all, if we wanted a hydrogen, we could have stuck with what we started with in the first place. All right, so yeah. Our whole goal here is not just to defunctionalize this, but to put a deuterium on here. Okay, so that's the same as what I had. D2O is like water, but it's got deuterium. But uh, obviously, we got to use the deuterium and not the hydrogen. All right, so that would then, uh, so, uh, So now we have this deuterium on here. This step should make some sense. Um, why is this donating electrons? Why is this at the tail of the arrow? Well, it has a negative charge. And why is this at the head of the arrow? Because it has a delta positive charge. So it makes sense that this arrow would go from the negative to the delta positive. So again, normally we, we, we try to keep Grignard reagents away from water because the water destroys the Grignard. But in this case, we want to destroy the Grignard. So this is exactly what we want to do. All right, um, now up to now, we haven't, I haven't been thinking much about the stereochemistry, uh, but now I'm going to draw some stereochemistry in here. I'll draw this stunnel group on the wedge and the deuterium on the dash. Um, you, could, uh, you can't actually ensure that the phenyl group is on the wedge here. You could end up with a phenyl group on the dash, um, but at least one of our products will have the phenyl group on the wedge. So that'll give us this. And now, we're ready now to put the deuteriums over here. Well, how do we put the deuteriums over here? Well, we already talked about that. Now, here's where we have to make sure the stereochemistry is going to work. We know that these two deuteriums will both attack from the same direction. Um, but what direction do we want them to attack from? Do we want them to attack from in front or from behind? Or, yeah. Yeah, from behind, in order to match this picture. And they really will. How do we know that the deuteriums are going to attack from behind here and not from in front? Because there's too much steric hindrance with the water. Yeah. Thing. Remember that this pH is actually a great big benzene ring. That's why he's using benzene here to put in that steric hindrance. This is really a huge benzene ring, which will be blocking one side. All right, so like I said, we can't really ensure that the phenyl group is on a wedge here. Uh, but what we can say is we know that the deuteriums are going to attack from the opposite side to where this phenyl group is. And that's really what we have to get for our product. He wants a product where the deuteriums are coming in from the opposite side to this phenyl group. Well, that's just going to happen naturally because of the steric hindrance from this phenyl group. So, um, so we're done. So let's see, we've got one, two, three, and this would be the fourth step. So one NBS, two magnesium, three D2O, four deuterium. Let's check that. We've got it. Oh, no, we didn't. We would have lost credit. Oh, the, the HP. Yeah, so remember that this oh. reaction started by forming a radical in an initiation step, right? But it's not easy to form radicals. It takes an input of energy to form those radicals in the initiation step. So it really is, um, uh, we really should be putting in light over here to show where the energy is coming from. Uh, yeah, so it's much better. Uh, it's always good to check the answer. So yeah, we should put in this light here. You might lose credit if you left that out. Um, this is one clue that we're doing a radical mechanism. We don't really use light for much except for radical mechanisms. Then magnesium, then D2O, then this. Okay, um, now what we wanted to go over here though was the thought process, because you won't see this exact problem on the test. So what were the thought processes here? Well, one key thing is you have to ask what changes do I need to make? And then what reactions do I know for making those changes? And you partly did well on that and partly had difficulty. What you did well on is that you saw that you needed to get rid of this pi bond and replace it with two syn deuteriums. And you remembered the reaction for doing that. All right, um, now the problem here is that we, uh, the other problem is that we have to remove this hydrogen and replace it with the deuterium. Now how can you possibly figure out what reaction to use there? Well, the first thing is to notice that this started with no functional groups. 
Anytime you see that you have to do something to an atom with no functional groups, you pretty much know you've got to do a radical mechanism, because that's just about the only thing you've learned how to do. Um, we can't do an SN2 here, because there's no leaving group, right? Um, we can't do an E2, because there's no leaving group. There's something with no leaving groups, there's almost nothing you can do except a radical mechanism. So if you see that you're going to have to manipulate a carbon with no, with no functional groups, then you pretty much know that it's got to be a radical mechanism. 